there was a, a live auction. I went to the auction and they had a motorhome for sale. And I didn't know much about motorhomes and their value, but it certainly looked like a good deal. I ended up <laughs> purchasing the motorhome at the auction and drove it home. It was around 16000 for the motorhome. And I knew after some research, I could flip it very quickly. You probably make 10 grand off the, the buying side. It's like one of the big, like, bus looking ones. Yeah, 16 grand? 32, yeah, 32 feet. 32 yeah, yeah. feet long, low kilometers. Like, it was in great shape. Hmm. But then I'm like, rather than flipping this, I wonder if we could use it this summer a couple times. And I wonder if there's a market to rent it out. I have rental properties. Why can't I rent out this motorhome? So I put it up, local classifieds. I put it up for rent. I put it up for 1400 bucks a week and it rented instantly. Strangers no sending way. me thousands of dollars of cash over the internet. Deposit. I think I made around 15,000 that summer. Wow. I got my entire purchase price back and it booked instantly all year long. When, 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 when I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. All right, well, let's uh, dive into it here. Now we're all set up. Super excited about this episode. Uh, we've got uh, Michael McNaught with Arvezi, and there's some historical context here, Neil. Yeah, right? I, I want to give a little background here before we jump into it with Mike. Um, I had made, we had made a challenge that we said we're going to bring in an idea on how to make a million dollars yes. the quickest. Yeah. And I forget, what was your idea? Uh, I think it was margin flipping. I was like, well, just kind of buy and, and resell stuff like assigned properties and, and things like that. Yeah. yeah. And then I said, well, I would go out and buy a bunch of RVs. I would finance them and then lease them out. And I kind of did a quick model on how you can lease them out and how financing is readily available. And you make this much money. And I think in a couple of years, I valued the business at a million bucks. Yeah. I feel like if you, if you apply a, a seven times multiplier to the revenue yeah. of the business, something <laughs> like that, uh, but, like, oh, it's, you got a million dollar business. But the internet, of course, it was a love-hate relationship, but we got a million views in the first week, and it was 50% people being like, I just bought an RV because of this. And yeah. the other half were like, this guy's an absolute idiot. The RV showed in the picture is not, it's a million dollars. It's one of the big bus, Greyhound bus ones. Right. Of course, that was just the edit. But the idea was the smaller either trailers uh, or smaller like drivable non-air brake RVs. Um, but anyways, it did really well. And I actually was at an event, a private banking event, and someone came up to me out of nowhere and they're like, Hey, I saw your clip on the podcast and I, I went out an and RV. I bought two RVs. I bought one for myself and one to rent out. And I was like, uh, he no. ended up at a party at my house and said the same thing. I met the same guy. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So and I was like, ooh, anyway, ooh, ooh, anyway yeah. so that took place and we're like, Hey, we, we got to hit you up. Uh, so we shot you an email or maybe did you, I don't know if you, did you end up seeing the clip? You know what? I, I got tagged in, I think, a okay. uh, TikTok. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And uh, and reached out because because really, you know, what, what you guys were mentioning about RVZ was exactly what started this entire business. Uh, you know, is the it was me being, you know, scrappy and yep. trying to find ways of how, how can I make some money uh, passively yep. off a depreciating asset. Yeah. And it's RVZ. So my apology. That's another thing. Like we, like we just discovered this thing. Like this looks like an incredible model. I'm like RVZ, but RVZ <laughs> actually makes a lot more sense. Yeah, R R V easy, R V Z. It's not R V hard. Yeah. Right. The whole idea is it's R V easy. We want to make <laughs> right. this easy for you. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned there, it was you wanted to be scrappy and make a bit extra cash. How did RVs come to be? Because I think there's a lot of people that try to be scrappy, make a bit extra cash. And I feel like RVs are like not necessarily the first thing or even the fifth thing that pops into your brain. Yeah. Um, I like it. What's the path to getting there? And then, and how do you kind of get to RVs? And, and what did that first one look like? Yeah, so it's actually kind of a fun uh, fun story of how we got started. My, my former career as a police officer, I uh, spent about 12 years policing. Uh, like a lot of police officers, I like to find things to do on my time off. And I started, I started flipping things, whatever mm -hmm. I can get my hands on to be able to flip and make a few bucks. Yep. So yep. I was flipping cars, products, anything I could find. This guy. Uh, yeah. That's like, I yeah. happened yeah. to, uh, and, and again, I, I saw an auction. There was a, a live auction. I went to the auction and they had a motorhome for sale. I didn't know much about motorhomes. I spent my <laughs> entire youth in Northern, Northern Ontario camping, um, but not as much RVing. And I didn't know much about motorhomes and their value, but it certainly looked like a good deal. So I didn't even know much about it. I ended up <laughs> purchasing the motorhome at the auction and drove it home. My no wife way. was quite surprised. <laughs> it was a foot vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I bought it for, I want to say, it was around 16000 for the motorhome. 
And I knew after some research, I could flip it very quickly and probably make 10 grand off the, the buying side. This is like one of the big, like, bus looking ones. Yeah, 16 grand? 32 feet, yeah, 32 feet. 32 yeah, yeah. feet long, low kilometers. Like, it was in great shape, hmm. right? It was a great, it was a great investment. But then I'm like, rather than flipping this, I wonder if we could use it this summer a couple times. And I wonder if there's a market to rent it out. I have rental properties. Why can't I rent out this motorhome? Mm -hmm. So I put it up, local classifieds. I put it up for rent. I put it up for 1400 bucks a week. And it rented instantly, literally instantly. Strangers no sent me thousands of dollars of cash over the internet. Deposit. I think I made around 15000 that summer. Wow. My entire purchase price back. And then I'm, so then I'm, then I'm wondering why is the demand so strong? Like what, like what, what's so special about this motorhome? Why does this exist? If you started looking at how you rented an RV seven, eight years ago, it, you were going to the local fleet dealership. You were purchasing that to have one of three models available. Yeah. It yeah. was priced about two, three times more than mine was priced. Yeah. And you didn't get any of the stuff that I threw in. You'd get my barbecue, my lid linens, my dishes, everything was thrown in. So really that that's what really started this opportunity in that I put up one ad on a classified. I never boosted it. It was probably on page 20 and people still found the ad and it booked instantly all year long. And we're, and were you, sorry, were were you, were you booking it uh, on the premise that they could then drive it and pay for their own gas? Or did you have it at that point parked somewhere? I mean, you mentioned the barbecue and all these things. Did you have it um, you know, at, at a park or where, where I found I've been successful in, you know, whether it's flipping things or an Airbnb concept or anything like that is I try to make things turnkey. Mm-hmm. So literally show up with a suitcase and you can drive this thing from my driveway and go on a vacation. Right. So you don't need anything. So I try to supply all of that. And yes, they'd be taking it across country a lot out to the East coast. That's such a huge trip in Ontario yeah. is take it from, Ontario, Nova Scotia. That's back. the loop. Yeah, um, that's the loop. I don't think my motorhomes haven't seen many other roads other than <laughs> Nova Scotia. Okay. First off, I got to say 16 grand. Every single person, not every single, but like probably there's probably 500 comments on the TikTok of like, it's $500,000, $500,000 to buy an RV minimum. And I'm like, that's not the case. Everyone watches the Will Smith RV on YouTube and they're like, that's what every RV is. Yeah, yeah. And and realistically, the people that want those RVs can buy their own damn RV, right? Or, like so, or a rental's twenty thousand a week. Yeah, by having a, a unit that's maybe a, a bit more modest, but still nice. Sounds like you got a smoke and deal, you capture a different demographic of, of, of renter. But on the flip side to that, what was the deal in maintenance? I have that was that was yeah. the next comment that we saw so much of is like maintenance is gonna be insane. So in my head, if you're buying a sixteen thousand dollar RV on an auction. The first road trip to Halifax, it just exploded. Like you got to Quebec City and the whole thing nuked itself, which clearly it didn't. But what was what would happen? There must have been some stories there. For sure. The, and, and the maintenance isn't terrible. Like it, it's a vehicle, right? So you have yeah. to maintain the vehicle, the driving components and the driving components are are fairly easy to maintain. I used to take that thing right through Mr. Loop for my oil. <laughs> you, you could drive it. You could drive a motorhome right through Mr. Loop. Not a lot of people know that. Not a lot of motorhome you know, now. Make, Right. You make sure your tires, your brakes are good. I'd say the more complicated component are going to be the RV components. Yeah. You need to make sure you maintain the generator and, and you know, all the electrical systems, the water system. There's a little more maintenance in that and really more knowledge that you need to gain about how to maintain it. But once you get it, no, it's you, you keep it going, uh, you know, a couple times a year, you're checking and maintaining it, making sure you, you get it out of storage and it's ready for the season. And then once again, at the end of the year, when you're ready to put it away. It, it's not too cumbersome, but but certainly, you know, there is an expense there to maintain the equipment. So what year was that in that you bought this first one that, that was kind of almost a happenstance, you know, you hadn't in, intended this really? Yeah, so that would be 20, 2014. Okay. 2014 going into 2015. Gotcha. So that was kind of be around the time where short-term rentals were starting to take off in general. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be around there? Yeah, Airbnb was starting to be more relevant. Yeah, Airbnb was more relevant. Uh, I believe Turo launched probably about a year before, and pro- actually probably right around that time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so they were renting cars right around that time. Yeah. Um, but then I, I very quickly realized why this business model didn't exist, is that insurance did mm-hmm. not exist. 
the moment the moment that you handed over the keys then someone paid you for the rental it is now deemed a commercial transaction yep. a personal insurance policy will not cover it if you wanted a commercial policy you're talking five to ten thousand dollars a year so it really wasn't viable for somebody to privately own a vehicle and rent it to someone else it just it, you couldn't do it so early on were you kind of just rolling the dice on that <laughs> no, I, I had a I had a pretty creative solution to it. Creative okay. information, uh, yeah. and and I, I, I and I, I got it covered by my insurance. They okay. they they said I found a loophole, like it, it worked. Um, Which they probably my, my argument was, my argument is that if I were to rent Neil my motorhome and he paid me for it, my insurance would not cover it. Mm -hmm. If I lent my RV to Neil, he would be covered. It's hmm. the same person driving the RV. The risk has not changed. Yeah. Why am I not covered? <laughs> so my my contracts, I would rent Neil my barbecue, <laughs> and then I would lend him the motorhome. <laughs> I, I like love it. that. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Thanks. That is genius. That's that's the most expensive barbecue rental I think that's out there. But yeah, that is. Yeah, it would be. It would be a very. Yeah, so you'd be rent, you'd be renting the equipment that came along with the motorhome. <laughs> the motorhome would be provided for free. Gotcha. And gotcha. That's, and then, to be honest, that's that's what really <laughs> got the insurance companies uh, looking at this business model mm -hmm. because they they will not invest into building insurance products if there's a solution in the market. Yeah, I clearly showed them that there was a gap in the market for a, for a, a, a product that's needed and that people are doing as it is. So that that's where, you know, RVZ kind of was born of saying, how do we now get everyone this opportunity to be able to rent out their RV to other people with proper insurance coverage without mm -hmm. skirting around the rules? I, I, I want to point out how ingenious what you did was like, we kind of just laughed about it and, and skimmed over it. But that mindset is kind of the difference in being able to make stuff happen and not. Yeah. Cause I think true. a lot of the, again, I'm going to go back to the, a lot of the people that comment on our posts that like, you can't do this, can't do that naysayer. You got to have a like, okay, there's got to be an alternative option to this. There's got to be a way around this. Yeah. And that's exactly what you did, which again, at the time just led, led to a $1,400 rental but now has led to a multi-million dollar company that you've built that is renting RVs nationwide every single day. Um, and it, and yeah. again, it, it's that mindset that allowed you to get there. So I just want to highlight that because it, it's, it's as amazing. As silly as it sounds and as silly as sometimes it, it gets made light of, of having like, there's no can'ts, right? Like there's only solutions, right? That you do kind of have to look at that, especially when you're doing something like this. So then it becomes a startup to some degree, right? Like, so you're, you're going from a cop um, you know, with some rentals and who has an RV to effectively you become a startup entrepreneur. Yeah. And, and so how that was born, uh, I was still policing, right? Back 2015, 2016, I was still a full-time police officer. Uh, I had three kids at home. I was competing in bodybuilding. I was finishing a university degree. Uh, not much spare time and probably doing, you know, 60 hours of policing a week. Uh, April 2016, I ended up getting injured on duty, uh, affecting an arrest, ended up getting in uh, a, a pretty bad physical altercation and uh, got pretty seriously injured. Shit. And so I ended up getting sidelined and uh, had surgery, wrote my last exam for university, obviously can't work out anymore, uh, couldn't really do anything. So I went from zero minutes a day available to suddenly all I had was time. Mm -hmm. And essentially leveraged that time and said, well, we had this idea. I now have five, six months off from work and I'm getting fully paid for it. Why don't we just get this thing off the ground and get an MVP and see if there's any product market fit? So mm -hmm. it was really, you know, splash page of a website. All the buttons looked really pretty, but it essentially just sent me an email and we'd make phone calls. And within the first couple of days of the, the website being up, we already had a couple of rentals. So, so like product you, market fit was pretty clear. You say get yourself a, a, a MVP. What's that yeah, acronym? Just a minimum viable product. Okay, right? it's gotcha. just getting. Right? We had, we had quotes up to three four hundred thousand dollars to create this website. Of course, mm -hmm. and we're not. You're not going to throw that money at an idea that you don't even know if people want to do that yet. Yeah. So we just got something really low tech, low budget. Got it up there. Do people want to do this? This is a bit of an aside, but two questions on that. Where did you find that person, and roughly, where did you spend? 
And I just know because there'll be a lot of people listening. And I know I've been in this position before where I have a great idea. And then I go out, I call, I look up website building company or whatever it is. And the same thing, they quote you $150,000. And I'm like, all right, well, that just kind of stifens the whole idea because I can't build a website. Uh, Squarespace isn't going to get what I need. And they're trying to hose me right now. So we, we set ourselves a, a $50,000 budget. Okay. Uh, we found someone local that was using uh, a technology called Drupal. It, it's kind of like building blocks, right? Yeah. Certainly not something you want to scale a marketplace into. Yes. But certainly a technology that could get a website up working very quickly. Yeah. And we just kept a very MVP product. It was very, Got very it. basic. You pressed a button, you wanted to rent it. I would be calling you. I would call the owner. I'd send you an invoice through PayPal. Everything was done manually. Everything. Yeah, there's no automations within that website. You were handling that to no, get started. Not, nothing was automated at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And, and so it the... didn't matter who you were talking to. It, whoever you were talking to, it was me. <laughs> Just the six it, different names on the website. Really <laughs> but so, so the initial offering was presumably you had... Um, how, how, did you, how did you find the supply of units initially? Right, because presumably people, like your listings on your website were other units that people would rent. Exactly. So there were other people doing what I was doing. So obviously the first place to go, and let's go to the people that are already doing this and provide them a different avenue of getting it done. Right. Uh, so it was really calling, I, I think I spent like every single night that summer, call it 6 p.m. to about midnight, I'd be uh, locked in a room just making phone calls to everyone I could that was had their RV listed for rent on any classified I could find and just convincing them to also put it on our website. We'll also start to create them demand and there's all these additional benefits that we can provide. Right. I love these hustle stories. I love these hustle stories. I spend a night locked in a room 6 p.m. to midnight, but I'm not calling anybody. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? I used to I used to try to come out a little earlier. And, uh, you know, I think like I, I have a really supportive wife, and uh, she would argue with me that it was still eight o'clock on the west coast of Canada, and I can still continue to make phone calls. Respect. Uh, That's was, sick. She wasn't wrong. She yeah, wasn't that is wrong. unreal. So, uh, and your offering to them was pretty simple. Probably like, hey, why not put it on my site? Right? Like at first. First thing, like, why not? Why, why not get more exposure? Um, and then presumably you would charge a premium, which would be your fee and you get more eyes on it. But you mentioned that you also provided extra things to them. What do you mean by that? Insurance? Uh, the, the, insurance the insurance, insurance, roadside assistance. The one thing I never liked about when I was doing it myself is that, so I'm the owner of the RV yeah. and this renter is going to hand over a security deposit that I'm going to hold on to. And then mm. I decide whether they get it back. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that was a very good experience for the guest, for the person traveling, mm-hmm. that there should be some sort of middleman that can yeah. help mitigate any issues that could arise. Right. Um, and, and, and you ask, they wouldn't list their RVs. I would do it for them. Right. Right. But they, they allow permission. Had, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. They, they, I, I had access to their pictures, their description, their pricing. I had everything that I needed. Mm-hmm. The, the less friction as possible. Let me do this for you. And then mm. you're going to get more exposure. Uh, so yeah, the insurance, roadside assistance, the security deposit, the money collection, all of that is much safer. Again, putting my police officer hat on, people were sending me thousands of dollars over the internet. They never mm-hmm. met me. They never saw the RV. The potential for fraud in that space was huge. Yeah, no doubt. I could have rented I could have rented the same weeks over and over and over again, a hundred times, six yeah. months in advance, and that money's gone. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like it would just disappear. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of rental scams component. like that Yeah, going on. Yeah, There's huge. So when you look on both sides of that marketplace, you kind of need that balance and that intermediary. At the same time as doing, like having the website, getting other people to list theirs on, on your site, were you building an inventory yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly was. Uh, <laughs> I ended up buying, uh, so my, myself and, and my partner, Will, I think we had a total of nine in total. Nice. And uh, and an important thing at the time is we purchased one of every single type of RV. Mm-hmm. So like we had Class A motorhomes, Class B, Class C trailers, fifth wheels, you name it. Right. Because really wanted to understand the difference between the customers of each type right. of RV. Yeah. How do people? This is uh, do people rent the fifth wheels? Because I was looking at a fifth wheel. I was like, how am I gonna like mount this thing on the roof of my SUV? Like, so that's that's the really uh, the interest, interesting thing that this that's come out of this business model is the concept of delivery. 
So you don't mm. need to have the F-150. You just need to have a campsite and a local owner that's willing to drop it off and deliver it to you. Fifth oh. wheels are by far the nicest models of all the RVs. Yeah, 10 yeah. foot ceilings, yeah. they're huge. Hmm, yeah, they're great. Yeah. All you gotta do, find where you wanna go, get a local owner, they'll drop it off, set it up for you and pick it up when you're done. You know right. what, you know so what fifth wheel is? Really? Yeah, this is the one that you pull behind the, the truck. Right? Well, but no, but it's one. the one that's got the big gooseneck that goes into your bed. So it doesn't yes, go on a trailer yes, hitch. Yes, yes, it's got yes. the big okay, arm that yep, goes inside yep. your bed. So yeah, like a normal over, overhang. You can't yeah. Yeah. Right. You need a three quarter ton or above to generally pull one of those, but they're the most spacious, the most, the, the, they're by far the best layout. So yeah. that and delivery option, like, it's amazing. About 40% of our trailers right now are delivered. They're not pulled by the guests. No How, way. What, what percentage of your trailers would you say don't move during the time of their lease? Like they, 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 that they don't move. They stay exactly where they were. Like someone shows up. Oh, so that, I, I'd say at least 40%. At least 40%. 40 are delivered. They're, they're delivered. 40% are delivered right, right to the, the campsite. The person never they moves it. For their week, they leave when they're done. But they're what moves. about people who maybe have their unit at a campsite for the full, full season anyway, and the people actually just come to them because that's where the unit already is. It doesn't have to be delivered. There, there's certainly a market for that. I actually love that market because that's how we used to vacation. We had a we had a fifth wheel that was permanently at a campground resort, mm -hmm. um, and having that opportunity for people to rent that, um, I think there's a huge opportunity there. We don't do a ton of that. To be that honest. More Airbnb, and that's that's we are competing much more with Airbnb when you talk right because it becomes mm -hmm. basically a fixed structure. It's not yeah okay yeah where where we're the way our insurance and everything is priced and works is that we kind of expect a certain exposure heading down the road mm -hmm. where when you go into these stationary units, it's a totally different experience. You right, know, it's, right. it's much more of an Airbnb. True. Uh, You're then in the cottage right, market. Yeah. 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 Road. Right. So do you have um, like operators on RVZ that like have built a business out of this that own 10, 20 of these units um, or do you have like a management thing? I think the thing in Airbnb we see a lot now is profiles are predominantly managers. They might own like three themselves and then they manage 30. Uh, like, is there something like that going on? Do you, do you see kind of a trend in that direction? I, I, it's been super fascinating to watch this industry evolve. Yeah. And it, it, it follows a lot of the stuff you've seen with Airbnb, but I'd say a couple of years behind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what we're seeing now is that, yes, you'll start off renting your own unit, find out how successful it is. You'll go buy a second, maybe a third unit. And then when you're starting to grow the inventory, what we've seen similar to Airbnb is they're not necessarily buying other units is they're doing more of a consignment yep. where they're, they're going to find their friends, their family, their neighbors that all own RVs and say, listen, I know you're not using it all summer. Let me manage this for you and rent it out for you, and we'll split the revenue. Well, you go to your your campsite, and you see, you know, you you become friends with all the other people at the campsite. You understand what their schedules are. Oh, they're here this week. They're somewhere else. It's so easy to spark up that conversation. Yeah. Like, what do you do with it? Well, it sits at home in the driveway. Like, how many houses we've sold where you go there, and there's actually the indents in the asphalt from where these units have sat there so long unmoved. It's like, my gosh, they, they could be making mm -hmm. serious money off this thing if they wanted to. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. An RV is typically used two to four weeks out of the year. So you're talking yeah. 11 plus oh. months that these things are sitting there. So oh I, my God. I may have I may have underestimated that when I did our clip. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I think I said like 50% utilization. Yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, okay, hold that's up. When so you, when you, no, wait, wait, wait. That's two to four weeks for an average family. What's the actual utilization for somebody who's renting them? Like oh, yeah, one of yours that you rent full time. What's, what's their occupancy rate? For, yeah. I don't know what you guys would call it, but. So, yeah. So it. it the Canadian side of the business. So you can expect if you have an RV, it'll be fully rented, call it kids out of school, kids back to school, mm -hmm. right? Okay. It'll be fully rented, You're, yeah. you know, end, end of June, all the way past September. Pretty much every then week, you'll solid. Likely, then you'll likely have two weeks per month, May, June, two weeks per month, September, October. And that would be so I similar would call to the Airbnb model. Season. Yeah, that, that's 35-ish percent. Yeah, that, that's 40% of, of, of the year almost, yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah, do anything with winter? For, we're seasonal in Canada. Yeah. You're not renting much in winter. You'll get the odd on a motorhome. You may get families heading down to, you know, going to Disney. In to Florida. Time. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. It's certainly much more challenging. The one interesting thing, though, is that now that we're all across North America, 
setting up our Canadian owners with successful owners in the U S and maybe bringing your RV down to California, oh. Florida, Texas, and being able to rent it out and monetize it all year long. I you think drive it. Yeah. You just drive it down there and fly back and give it to one right. of these third party management system. Like, yeah, man, run this thing. Yeah. They even have shipping. I've seen shipping trucks. will have like six trailers in the back and they yank them down. So um, how much money are people like, how much so I, I can, I'll, I'll give you an example of, uh, so this was my personal motor home. Um, so I, following those same stats of like, it's rented all summer, two weeks on the shoulder seasons, it was doing about 35,000, uh, a summer, right? So that's, Gosh. that's ca- cash to me, 35,000. That's net of on, on one unit. And you're saying that's net of maintenance, net of insurance, net of, Oh, that that's gross. That's gross. Okay. Now, now to operate, own and operate maintenance, insurance payments and everything on that was about 15,000 a year. So you yeah. made 20 so grand. You're making, you're making about 20 grand. How much does a unit like that cost? That I purchased that one for 80,000. So that's, you can finance it. Yeah. You know, for, for, so when you look so you, at the, yeah. when you look at financing, they will finance uh, an RV up to 20 years. So if you oh, buy man. a, if you buy a Four two thousand. year old motor home, they'll finance it 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. Five year old, 15. So when, so I, I'm a cash flow guy. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yep. what, I, that's what I look at. Yep. Uh, so you're looking at payments anywhere, you know, 800 to a thousand bucks a month, typically, if you're buying the motor home. Yeah. And you're averaging, if you take out all the months, it's not even working. You're averaging like 1700 a month, 1650 a month. And, and, and all that interest that you're paying is also a deduction, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. Like I, I always looked at the cash flow. My money out is a thousand a month, but I'm getting ten grand a month in the summer times coming in. Mm-hmm. And this is the this is another really exciting thing about RVZ, and 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 really it was out of my personal experience what brought this product on, is that we all we're, we're trying to create entrepreneurs, right? So like one concern, and this came up, I had a reservation that was going to pay me ten thousand dollars for the month of August. Wow. It, right before that, I had a three-day rental going out that's get paying me six hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. I started getting worried. I'm like, if this six hundred dollar rental gets into an accident, I, I just lost ten thousand dollars, and mm. I need that ten thousand yep. dollars to find to, to support this investment. Yep. Right. So we now provide uh, payout guarantee, so income protection. That in wow. the event that happens, we're still paying out that ten thousand dollars to you. Wow, that's actually really impressive. Um, that's the economy of scale and like where these platforms really add value and get so good. It's like, man, make it as simple as humanly possible. Well, yeah, and, and they take away because the, the loss ratio might only be three to four percent, but the one person who gets unlucky and gets takes that loss, they're they're hooped. But if you spread it across everybody, it's not so bad. Um, it's affordable, really. the The question I had though was how long? So that eighty thousand dollar unit. What does depreciation look like? I know there's like, I would say what I'm going to call normal depreciation from normal use, which is minimal. And then is there kind of a different level of depreciation because it's being used as a rental? Because I found in the, in like in the car market, rental cars well, go to auction from, and they typically yeah. have a bit more of a depreciation. Like, is there an ideal model there where you buy it, you run it for two years and then you get out of it before it starts to really show its wear and tear? I, I call it three to five. Okay. And it's not necessarily the wear and tear more than the mileage, especially mm-hmm. on a motorhome. Yeah. yeah. So what I would look for, what I would look for as an investment would be uh, a, a good deal with something with low mileage. And then after your three to five years, I'd find after that point, it starts to depreciate faster. Mm-hmm. So now it's time to get rid of the unit while the mileage is still reasonable to yeah. sell back into the private market. Yeah. Um, and then what I would always go for, and this is kind of, this isn't a rule. This is my rule of how I operated my RV. Mm-hmm. But I essentially wanted to earn one dollar per kilometer driven in a year. So that thirty thousand dollars that I earned in a year, mm-hmm. I should have, if for a really good investment, it would have traveled thirty thousand kilometers that year. Yeah. And, and that that way, right? You think ninety thousand kilometers over that three year period, I've made ninety thousand dollars off of that. And I might have depreciated maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars off the purchase price. Yeah, it's time that's to send her out the pasture. The yeah. So yeah. I used to judge, I used to judge my rentals and pick the rentals I wanted based on that metric. Am I going to get one dollar per kilometer driven? And really, it was modeled after the Ontario to Nova Scotia two week trip. Mm-hmm. That would essentially model out to my one dollar a kilometer. Where if I had a ten day trip from Ontario to BC and back that it, it just didn't make sense for me financially. 
Gotcha. That's super interesting. Yeah. So for someone starting today, like one of our listeners who would say I, they're interested in doing it, what would be your advice in what they should be buying and how they should be buying it regarding financing? And then is it going to be profitable for them and kind of like, what are your, what are your tips and tricks for someone that's looking at this? That's young right now. They want to get a little bit of extra cash flow. Real estate market psychotic. Walk them through it. Walk me through it as if I'm trying to get into this right now. Yeah. What I would do, I would buy a class B motorhome. Okay. So that's, that's the van style, you know, a road trek. Yep. Um, any of those. Okay. You're going to want to keep it. They're usually 19 to 21 feet. And the reason I would suggest okay. that is that you could put this in your residential driveway and completely service it from there. Right. Okay. Yep. You don't, you don't need to drive it. You could wash it in the driveway. You could dump it. It, it, it actually allows you to dump it at home. You have, you can do no all the setups. Everything is taken care of out of your driveway. You cater to couples or small families going on RV trips. So mm-hmm. they're typically doing one to two week trips. Okay. The demand is insane. Like yeah. And they're less intimidating as someone who maybe doesn't, hasn't done this before from a, just a, the, the person who rents it. Right. Those units yeah. are a little bit and, less intimidating. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're going it, to, it's much less intimidating. Um, you're a passenger, you're essentially a passenger vehicle. So there's not too much learning as far as driving. You're not okay. driving a 37 foot bus down the road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all of the RV components are the same regardless, whether it's a big or small RV, they're essentially the exact same. Okay. And you can pick one of those up, call it a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Okay. Low find something low mileage or brand new in that hundred thousand dollar range. Your monthly payments again are gonna be around a thousand bucks. Okay. And you're gonna be renting that for three, four hundred dollars a night all year long. And it's super, super easy to manage. And again, okay. fi- finance them. Absolutely, I would just finance them because it's super easy to finance. Um, and and you're making money instantly. I also you go pit- into the real estate yeah. market, you're buying a rental, you need 20% down. Mm-hmm. Right, your your half million dollar condo is going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars in down payment. Is there a down payment on these, or usually is it minimal? Like, or they'll zero, do, sometimes zero lose zero down for zero you. Zero dollar down, you'll drive. Zero dollar down, you'll drive it off the lot. Shapers, and and I also picture those units as being especially easy to rip down across the border, hand the keys to someone in the states, and be like, all right, now you run this for our off season. Exactly, and yeah. and and it, it, it's the maintenance. It's like, I loved my motorhome. It was a 37 foot bus. Mm-hmm. But when I wanted to wash it, I had to take it to a truck wash and mm-hmm. get in line with the dump trucks. I had to take it to a dumping site. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 it would take me about two and a half, three hours to turn it around. Mm-hmm. Where this, you're doing it in your driveway, you're driving through Mr. Lube, you're taking it to a local mechanic. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to maintain. And the demand is. It, it's so big. So and you're not yeah. you're not overly concerned about who's taking it, where they're going. You're you're generally getting older retired couples that that's a lot of them, or you know younger couples that are looking out uh, for a getaway. And you're probably you want to extend the rental. Yeah. The longer the rentals, the better. You don't want to be doing three day rentals back to back to back. Yeah. You yeah. want it out for two weeks at a time. Like Airbnb. Comes back, you turn it around, goes back. Yeah. yeah. And you're probably in it all in it for a year. Twenty thousand dollars, all expensable, right? Like the the loan payments, all all those things, and then bringing in, like you said, maybe thirty thousand, maybe more, maybe forty five. Thirty forty k, yeah, thirty forty k. I'd be comfortable saying that. Yeah, yeah. Like it's uh, again, you're especially a brand new class B. You'd be like, I'd say three fifty to four hundred a night is what you're getting. And you get a hundred right? nights anyway, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, that doesn't take very long to start making money on that. And yeah. especially yeah. if you start leveraging our, our North, our, our U S exposure and get it down South. California is a 12 month RV season mm-hmm. with, you know, tens of millions of international travelers coming every year. That's is that a, a more competitive, market. is it it's a big market? Is it more competitive? It's well, it, it, it's competitive, but there's, there's too much. There's demand. still, there's there's still demand supply. demands outstripping supply. You could almost make there's a case for just a lot of international travelers, people coming to Canada or the U S to California, to Utah is a huge destination. The international travelers want the RV experience. And if, if you've ever been to Germany mm. or the UK, they don't have big motorhomes like we have here. No. They're mm-hmm. all yeah. van style camper vans. There's a certain and Americana. Here, yeah. And, and it, <laughs> And they want to come over and they want to do the same thing. So mm-hmm. they want to rent a van and they want to go tour around the national parks. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have such a huge exposure to 
everyone that wants to do this. I'm sure there's some ramifications to this, but couldn't you make a business case of just getting five of them and parking them all down in the States and being like, I don't even need them up in Canada. Like, I have no interest in having absolutely. them up here. Yeah, no I, rust, no winter. And a reason to go down? No storage. And there's, out there, there's actually a number of manufacturers that are currently looking for called franchisees where they're, they're doing a similar to like almost like a U-Haul model where they're manufacturing them and looking for hosts that will sign up as a franchisee and essentially rent out their fleet for them and do a revenue split. So those business models, just like an Airbnb, are starting to get fast and furious and competitive all across North America. What's your sort of market share? Like, are they still going through you or are some of these people trying to go direct to consumer without you? The thing is we're, we're generating the demand. Yeah. So like they we're, we're similar to, again, like Airbnb, you'll have people that will have their own demand generation, but Airbnb is so powerful with the demand that of course you're going to do both. Yeah. And if you do it in one locale, you're going to do it at another locale and they're like, well, I might as well go to the platform that has all the locales and once like one circle. Yeah. you, You want the demand. If I'm, uh, if I'm renting out my cottage, my house, my RV, whatever it may be, give me as much exposure as possible and give me all the demand. Mm-hmm. That really allows you to kind of fine tune your bit, your business model. Mm-hmm. I have two final questions. Before, I'll let you ask yeah. anything you want to say before. Well, I was just curious what, what, uh, the future holds for RVZ. No, I was gonna say, what, what is your cut of it as, as the platform? Like what's obviously we know the benefits, the, the basically effectively a group insurance policy, all these protections, uh, what, what's what's the cut? What's the revenue share? So I, on on our owner side, it'll really depend because where we're going and you, you kind of alluded to it is like, where does RVZ go from here? Yeah. The way that I see what we're building on that owner side, the supply side, we're building the uh, we're building software for small business owners to own and operate and manage their RV rentals. Yeah. Whether you own one or you own 20. We're a software company building tools. Mm-hmm. So our, our fees that we charge to our owners are flexible depending on what types of services you want. So it can range anywhere from, from 20% onward, depending on what you want. Mm-hmm. Do you want additional marketing? Do you want that income protection? Uh, we're also looking at like uh, guaranteed income. So there's a whole stream of products. With the timeshare guaranteed income depend- stuff. Yeah. Right. It all depends on what you want, but kind of the base level, you can kind of think 20%. Mm -hmm. which you guys being entrepreneurs, you'll know that running a business with only having 20% uh, overhead is a pretty good business model. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very good business model. And that actually makes an interesting point because I think Airbnb, Uber, and a lot of these platforms are going to go to something where it's a modified fee structure for people who do it maybe as a business versus individuals um, because I think some businesses are struggling to scale based on the current splits that are being offered. And so they might get into like a, a set payment amount per month plus a small split, something along those lines to try and allow operators to grow or, grow their, their set business. Or build some things into the platform whereby they don't have to go and, and take on this extra overhead, right? Like yeah. you get to the point with some of these people who are like, they had one unit, then two units, now they're managing these things. Like, oh, now they need managers and spreadsheets and QuickBooks. And yeah. like, they're oh crap, this happened accidentally. I'm now actually running a business and I need all these things. So the more tools you can provide um, in-house on, on the platform, the better. And that's, yeah. and that's what we are on the supply side, right? Yeah. It's, we're, we're software for people to manage their RVs. Mm. So the, the difference between us and Airbnb is, is the risk component. Everybody stayed in a house before. Not everybody's been in an RV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's, there certainly things happen. Things need to get fixed. These are moving down the road. There's going to be insurance claims. There's going to be accidents. There's a whole bunch of risks that simply do not exist in the Airbnb world. Yep. So as a company, we need to address those risks and mitigate them for our hosts. So mm-hmm. we do that through a variety of products and guarantees and, and whatever it may be that will help people continue to grow their fleet, right? Yep. It, it, it's hard taking on a hundred thousand dollar risk, you know, as far as buying this RV. If, if, if this thing gets into an accident, I've lost all of my income. Yeah. So like that, yeah. that's certainly something we we've addressed and we're continuing to build more and more products for that. Amazing. So yeah, you're trying to make it as easy as possible and reduce the risk as much as possible because, like you said, it is it is a riskier environment than a standard real estate play that you'd see in Airbnb. Uh, my, my my counterpoint to that is, uh, you're kind of flying under the radar. Like, there's some people who are tapped into the RV world, and then there's everyone else that has no idea what's going on in it. So, the risk of say government regulation and oversight and just cracking down. Because we always say it's so frustrating 
here where you start ma- doing something, you're doing good, you're making some money, and then you get cut off at the knees, right? They're coming for the short-term rental market, like full guns blazing, right? Like they're going to try to kill that one way, shape, or form. I feel like the risk mitigation in this, from that perspective, is actually like it's less risky to do this because I don't think there's this, you're not competing with, with traditional housing stock, which is what everyone views short-term rental are. You're not yeah. causing this housing crisis. So, um, but my question, I guess, would be as part of that is what possible regulation challenges have you faced or, or do you foresee moving forward? So that, 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 that's been a, something very close to us from the very beginning. Because when we first launched, if you remember back 2015, 2016, that was the peak of the Uber taxi drivers. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, Airbnb yeah. and condo boards. And from the beginning, we've never viewed ourselves as disruptors. We always like to label ourselves as enablers. It's our belief, and the data has been showing that as well, is that we are growing the RV industry as opposed to stealing somebody's lunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're getting more people are traveling, more people are booking campgrounds. The economic impact of our owners renting out their units, if you think about this, during the pandemic, we paid out tens of millions of dollars to local Canadians for renting to their neighbors, right? You're keeping all this money local. Mm-hmm. And it's not the people, the downtown Toronto condo dwellers. It's all the small communities throughout Canada that are benefiting from this. Yep. When you're traveling in an RV, you're not going to downtown Toronto. You're going to small communities that can use the tourism, that Absolutely. can use that economic impact. Yeah. So, you look at the economic impact of the business that we've created, and it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars across North America. So certainly the insurance component is important. The trust and safety of our of our customers, both on the renter and owner side, is really important. But we've been working alongside the industry, the provinces, the regulators, of showing them how this is actually growing the economy and is more of a benefit and an enabler as opposed to disrupting something and causing friction. Yeah, yeah, no, and I that's think that's point. what makes yeah. us uniquely different from some of these other business models that have come in and truly disrupted a previous business that used to exist. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a benefit really uh, in a lot of ways. Um, do you have any more questions? No, no, I think that's really interesting. I think it's, it's, a, it's a cool way to look at that. Um, it, we always talk about how it's best if you're flowing with the government than flowing mm-hmm. against and it is a way to be okay we're championing tourism and there's a lot of money and there's a lot of push be- around that without cutting these other you know you're actually helping parks you're not working against parks you're helping these restaurants you're helping these communities you're not kind of uh chewing into them yeah, yeah. i have th- i actually have three questions do you have um do you have people who ultimately end up moving to the point of just long-term renting the rv in a, in a set position like Full time, like signing, signing like a twelve month lease. Have you had some of that? Have some experience with that? Uh, with, with, what's kind of interesting, a use case that we've had, and uh, it actually works out really well. The RV owners love it when they come in. Is that often you'll have a rural community or someone that lives in a rural house, and they'll have an insurance mm-hmm. claim. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a flood. Oof, the, yeah. the kitchen catches on fire. They don't want to pull their kids out of school, don't Mm -hmm. want to change the bus route. They have a hobby farm to maintain. So they don't want to be picked up and put in a hotel, but Mm -hmm. they'll stay in an RV in their driveway for six months. Or they're doing a big renovation. Yeah. Or or rentals. Yeah. So we'll often get long-term rentals, call them in the two to six month timeframe for that type of stuff. It doesn't move. The owners are getting paid extremely well for their That's a dream. That is and sweet. it solves a problem for that customer. Mm-hmm. So, that is yeah, absolutely. sweet. We do see a lot. Uh, we do see a lot of those coming in, and it makes sense. So mm-hmm. even the like natural disasters that happen of setting up, you know, yep. clusters for the emergency workers to get in. RVs are perfectly suited for that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. That is interesting. Question two. Um, question two. Are there any Unimogs up there for rent? <laughs> I have not seen one. What's a Unimog? Uh, that's the giant Mercedes like overlanding vehicle. But the thing is, they weren't built with a bed on the back. But in Europe, a lot of people convert them and put like a uh, okay. a unit on the back of them. 
think, they, I think they're also like three to 500K. Yes, they are a little aggressive. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> just yeah. curious because I was like, I will fly somewhere to rent a Unimog. They look yeah, so they're, cool. They're, they are pretty, they are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. but, but I, what I think is interesting is you're getting a lot of smaller manufacturers getting into this business that are producing some pretty cool motor homes and trailers. Purpose built for this too, I imagine. Yeah. 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 And you're seeing, especially the van life kind of movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I think is going to be exciting is going to be the, the electric uh, RVs that are coming out. Oh yeah. Um, Solar. I know Air, yeah. Airstream released a, um, you know, a concept uh, and it, it kind of took me by surprise, but it's an electric travel trailer. So it, the travel trailer has a drivetrain to it. So it's actually pushing alongside your vehicle so no it's actually, way. So you think about the fuel economy or efficiency, the distance oh, range on your electric vehicle. That is sick. And then you'd park it through an app, right? You'd, it yeah, yeah. itself. So no I, way. I never thought that that would have been their first kind of model, but Airstream is coming out with this electric travel. Making it war way more usable, way more efficient. That is sick. You're going to see like little like cars yanking an Airstream down the road because yeah. they won't For need sure. the juice. But before you, before you your last question. Do you have a threshold for what constitutes a vehicle that could be on RVZ? Because I'm thinking of some of these converted vans, or I'm even thinking of like some old Westphalia that that someone's made it kind of cute. Like, what's the threshold for someone? Yeah, we'll do uh, 20 years for motorhomes, and we'll do 25 for trailers. We do. There are some exceptions, but typically it, it's it's held to that 20 year mark, like, like an antique restoration or something. Age wise, like under. Yeah, age wise. But like no square footage, no amenity limitation. It's like no. I got a van. No. Okay. But it's the it's the age of the vehicle. Right. You don't that 1970s Westphalia. Um, I wouldn't travel more than two three hundred kilometers down the road from that thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. That we want good travel experiences. Yeah. Yeah. You thinking you're gonna slip a, a mattress in the back of the Rav Four and throw it on there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, well. I rented a West Philly actually in BC, and yeah, it was pretty funny because you hammer down going up the highway, mm. and like 70k an hour, and it just speeds dropping, and people are passing, and the, the heat gauge is going up. Um, but anyways, yeah, it was fine. a fun experience. But the last and final question, million dollar question, we could say: Can you make a million dollars renting RVs? Um, I think you absolutely can make a million dollars renting RVs, especially the way that we kind of described it is starting off and understanding the business, get into it with one, one or two units, start growing that fleet and then start doing the consignment component. I don't even think it would take that long to make a million dollars. I I'd argue that we probably have some owners currently today that are well on their way, if not like well over halfway there within only a couple of years. So we, we have owners that have 40 plus units that started off. The man himself has <laughs> confirmed the clip. This is being yeah. made into a clip now and yeah. we are reposting this whole thing. And I'm going to be like, look, everybody, I'm going to add all the comments, yeah. tag them in this next post. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, you absolutely can. Yeah. <laughs> and again, like I, I started off with, I had rental properties and I started seeing like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't need a down payment. I can literally walk into a dealership and drive this off the lot. And I'm making, you know, 15, 20,000 profit per year per unit. Yep. That's a pretty simple math equation to figure out how to get to a million. Well, well even like that profit I'm threshold sold. of call it 30%, right? Like if you're, if you're netting 30% above all your expenditures, I mean, good luck finding that in, in traditional rentals, honestly, like unless you have no mortgage on the place or, or what have you. But uh, I think the other thing that's kind of cool from this is that um, it'll, it's opening up other people to this idea of, RVing and ex ex seeing places that maybe they wouldn't have, have seen otherwise and experiencing our country in, an, in another way. It's not just about, hey, you could be the person, you know, renting these and making money. It also, you know, you could be the person going up there and traveling and, and having a cool experience of You're feeling really cute today in your pink. Oh. Well, you, you get to use this <laughs> thing, right? You get to yeah. use that unit as well. Yeah. And what, what I, the other thing I loved about it is, you know, you don't have long-term tenants. Like these are people <sighs> going on a vacation. <laughs> Yeah. They're in and out. They're in and out in a week or two weeks, right? And it moves yeah. on. And people are going on vacation. People are generally in a happy, good mood going on vacation. True. Yeah. Right? You're not dealing with a, a different type of situation. So you, you mm -hmm. have great experiences, make, meet amazing people, and you don't need to deal with you know crappy tenants if you happen to get into them mm -hmm. on a long term rental mm -hmm. or parties, right? That you're yeah. renting to families going on a vacation. Yeah. It's a really nice market to be in. That's awesome. I love it. I'm just so happy with that last little bit Michael said. Yeah. Check out RVZ. 
we're gonna we'll have you guys linked in everything. It's pretty easy to find. You guys have an app. Um, hopefully, some more of our listeners buy some RVs. Yeah, and yeah. Throw them up there. I'm now. We should. We I'm should like s- wanting a motorhome pretty bad now. We should set up some sort of promotion with you guys sometime, just like for people to come through our platform to get to you guys. Just because I think I'd love to see how many people who've never like gone in an RV before. You know, hopefully, some people see yeah. us and, and actually go out and have an excursion. So. And and we actually uh, we actually have a button on our website. Um, that says buy an RV and we will hook you up with exclusive deals with a lot of our dealerships that we work with to be able to get there we you go. a proper RV that's going to generate you some income. That is awesome. I'm going to email you direct. I'm expecting a better link. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time, Michael. We really appreciate it. Uh, this was amazing. We answered a ton of questions. And like I said, I think I, I genuinely think we've already had someone who bit the bullet we, that we know yep. of. I feel like from this, we will be definitely getting, you'll be definitely getting some more uh, hosts that are going to come on. Yeah, man, I can't wait to see who, you know, people comment below if you're going to do this either on, like you're going to go on a trip or you might consider getting into investing one. So thanks a lot, Michael. Excellent. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe. But also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. Broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.